Hello, fellow Badgers. Thank you for joining us tonight for another episode of our event series, The Business Of, where we feature alumni and friends working in the business of your favorite things. My name is Natalie Singer, and I work on the alumni relations team at the Wisconsin School of Business, and I'm delighted to be hosting the Business of Toys event tonight. I'm excited for you to meet our three wonderful speakers who all have such an interesting story from working in the toy industry. So starting off, I would like to welcome David Kosnoff. David is the Vice President of Quality Assurance at Hasbro and leads a global team that ensures they are delivering safe and reliable play experiences for children and families. He also has experience at other big name toy companies, Mattel and American Girl. He has his MBA from here at the Wisconsin School of Business. So thanks for joining us today, David. Thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. Great, um, next I'd like to introduce Sean Dennis. Uh, Sean is a lecturer here at WSB and a member of our Center for Brand and Product Management Advisory Board. She is currently on the board for Goldie Blocks, an organization focused on reaching girls at a young age to introduce them to science, technology, engineering, and math through toys and content. She's also spent a great portion of her career in toys, including a past role as Chief Marketing Officer and Senior Vice President of Marketing at American Girl. So welcome, Sean. Hey there, excited to talk about my favorite subject. <laughs> and our final speaker for this evening is Tom Kalinske. Tom has had an illustrious career in the toy industry, landing him in the Toy Industry Hall of Fame. He has led many of the top toy companies, including CEO roles at Mattel, Matchbox, Sega, <laughs> Leapfrog, and Knowledge Universe, and is credited with reviving the Barbie and Hot Wheels brands during his tenure. Uh, he's an alumnus of UW, currently serving on the External Advisory Board at the School of Business, and he was previously named a Wisconsin Distinguished Fellow. So welcome, Tom. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here to talk about my very favorite subject. <laughs> Great. Uh, so thank you all again for being here tonight with us. Um, I know I gave a little bit of background on each of you, but I'd love for the audience to get a little bit more sense of your career so starting off with you, David, can you tell us a little bit more about how you ended up in the toy industry and a bit about your role? Sure, I'd be happy to. So you have to go back a little over 20 years ago, and it was a snowy day driving up to Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I get to the apartment uh, that uh, is my temporary housing and uh, to start my job at American Girl and nobody's in the office i can't find anybody eventually i find them all and where were they well let's let's think it's january 1st 2000 they were all in the clubhouse watching ron dane trample all over stanford <laughs> which was a great introduction to madison and great introduction to american girl um it was i fell into toys by accident the company that I was working for previously uh, had been sold, and my last official job was creating an org chart without my name on it. And uh, Steve O'Brien, who I'd worked with in the past, uh, asked me to come up and work for him again at American Girl. And uh, so I was in a director of operations role for several years. Um, about four years in, I convinced Steve and Mattel to pay for an executive MBA at UW. And part of the deal there was I knew that when I started that, I might have to move when I graduated. And my wife said, no problem, as long as it's not California or China. And of course, the next two jobs were in Los Angeles and in Hong Kong. Uh, but it's been a great it's been a great ride. Um, I've gotten to do operations uh, since 2006. I've been in quality and safety and compliance. Um, really rough introduction to that field where we really, it was 2006 and 2007, which were the year of the recall, where we recalled about 24 million toys uh, for magnets coming loose and lead paint. But that then created an opportunity to go to Hong Kong and help clean up the supply chain in Asia. Um, eventually made it back to the US only to go back to Hong Kong again when I started with Hasbro. So I've had a great ride. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks, David. And Sean, I know you've had a vast experience in a lot of industries, but uh, could you give us some highlights of your roles in working in toys? In toys, sure. I got out of college and 
went right into brand assistant in CPG. So I know we have a lot of folks who do that. And, uh, and it just wasn't um, exciting enough because if you can imagine calculating coupon redemptions with no internet <laughs> and, and no computers, we didn't have computers. So I got a call to join Kenner Toys in 1986. Now I know I look very young, but it was Chuck Norris action figures and the first Ghostbusters toy line. And I said, yes. So I found myself in Cincinnati and that was my introduction to toys. And I gotta say all the roles I've been in from computers to credit cards to the NFL, toys just kept coming back and coming back. And I think it's because Toys are the epitome of living stories that are meaningful to us. And the why of stories and the why of toys is what makes it so fascinating. So I got back into toys as the SVP uh, of uh, head of marketing and product and publishing for American Girl. Um, it was delightful. It was amazing to see the role that that product played building girls of confidence. And it was the building girls of confidence that allowed the premium pricing and meant that moms and dads were as excited about spending $100 for a doll as the girls were getting those dolls because they knew that there was something magical about it. Uh, as part of that role, I was working with DreamWorks to set up a TV show and DreamWorks asked me to join their company um, as head of franchise to reinvent trolls. Trolls from 1965. My mother played with trolls. I played with trolls. And, uh, and so that's what got me to DreamWorks. But then I moved on to heading up franchise for all of their products with an intent to help the filmmakers understand what meaning and context are in the film and how are kids gonna play with that? What's gonna make something playable? Uh, after DreamWorks sold to Comcast, I had been on the board of Goldie Blocks and I moved to be the president of Goldie Blocks. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed that again because of the mission driven uh, toy brand that it was. Since then, I've uh, joined several toy boards. I'm on the board of Slumberkins right now, which is again mission focused, but about social emotional learning. And Huge Play, had, and we'll talk a little bit about technology is breaking down barriers with a product called GameBud, uh, GameBud Talking Tom, which is literally playing a game with you. So it's just, there's always something new in this industry and it's very exciting. I love that. Thanks so much, Sean. Um, and Tom, I know your experience in toys is numerous. So if you could just give us some highlights of your career. Okay. Well, I after graduate school, I joined uh, J. Walter Thompson in New York City, and I worked in a special group that created new products. And one of the products we worked on was Flintstones Vitamins, which uh, became the number one chewable vitamin in the world in 1968, and I think it still is today. Well, Mattel thought that was pretty interesting, and so they contacted me and asked me to join, and I loved the idea of moving from New York to Los Angeles. So I went out to L.A. and worked for Mattel initially as a product manager on preschool toys, which in those days, uh, we're talking 1971 now, was CNCs and jack-in-the-boxes and wooden putt-putt cars and what have you. And uh, one day after I actually helped grow that business a bit, and one day the founder, one of the founders of Mattel, Ruth Handler, came into my cubicle, which was right outside the ladies' room, so I had a lot of visitors, and she said, Tom, Barbie sales declined last year. The retail buyers say it's over for Barbie. The Wall Street analysts say it's over for Barbie. My own sales force says we should go on and do something else. Retailers are fed up. What do we do? They, they're telling me we should drop it. What do you think? I said, Ruth, that's the stupidest thing I have ever heard. Barbie will be around long after you and I are gone. She said, that's what I wanted to hear. I'm going to talk to Ray, who was my boss, about getting you on the Barbie business. And so that's how I ended up on the Barbie business. And I implemented a strategy that we called the segmentation strategy. But before Ruth left my cubicle, I said, Ruth, what to you? Why is Barbie so special? And she said, Tom, with Barbie, a girl can be anything she wants to be. I use those words, that phrase on packaging and PR and advertising 
for the next 17 years. And along the way, somewhere they stopped using it, but then they started using it again recently, I noticed. Anyway, I grew the sales from 42 million to about 450 million by segmenting the market in play pattern, by age, having dolls for very young girls, having collector dolls for collectors at $100, having low price dolls, having very expensive dolls, having hair play dolls, uh, and doing lots of different accessories, but most importantly, doing role, role playing. And had, had uh, Barbie become a doctor, had veterinarian Barbie, had uh, astronaut Barbie was a big one, even did President Barbie back in 76, so a little bit ahead of our time. And, and we grew the business, as I said, to about $450 million. I turned it over to the best hire I ever made, Jill Barad, and she grew it to $2 billion. Along the way, I was kept getting promoted. So when I was a vice president of marketing, eventually they put Hot Wheels under me and I did the same kind of segmentation strategy on it and grew Hot Wheels to about a, about $100 million. Uh, and then somewhere along the line, I was a senior vice president. We introduced Masters He-Man, Masters of the Universe, largely a research-based product, and, uh, and grew it to about $500 million and, uh, and developed a TV show that uh, in many markets is still, still running today. And I became president of Mattel, which was a, a conglomerate in those days. And one of our divisions was Ringling Brothers Barman Daily Circus, which was losing money. Another one was in television, which was losing money. Another one was Western Publishing, which was losing money. And the only thing making money was the toy division. So I ended up becoming the, the CEO of, of Mattel. Did that for a few years. We had a co-CEO office. And after a while, I, I decided I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. I had tried to buy Matchbox toys out of bankruptcy in the UK and failed, but a friend of mine did succeed, a guy named David Ye, and he asked me to join him. So I became CEO of Matchbox toys, took it public on the New York Exchange, uh, did that for three years, was traveling like, like David was. I was going from Los Angeles to Hong Kong to London to Nuremberg, back to Los Angeles in you know, I have six children, so it was kind of hard to do that. And uh, I ended up uh, uh, leaving and, and uh, actually sold the company, helped David sell the company to uh, Tyco Industries, which later Mattel bought. So Matchbox, that's how Matchbox ended up at Mattel, if anybody wonders. Uh, I joined uh, Sega, the video game company, when it was very small. And we took on Nintendo. And over the next uh, six years, we built Sega. Uh, by doing more sports products in the United States, by doing more American licenses, by developing Sonic the Hedgehog. And we ended up passing Nintendo in share of market. Nintendo, when I started, had a 98% share of market, and at three, we had passed them with 54% share, share of market. So uh, then uh, after, after Sega, I joined with Mike Milken and Larry Ellison, and they each invested. They were interested in using technology to improve education. And so one of the first companies we we bought was leapfrog when it was doing three million in product and leapfrog was a very interesting company because actually most of the early products were designed by stanford professors and uh we ended they really knew how to do education well and then the toy part of leapfrog knew how to make education interesting so we grew that to about 680 million dollars um i left there in 2005 and ever since then i've been doing ed tech companies and uh, serving on boards. Uh, I'm also a venture capitalist. I'm a, I'm a minor partner at Elsop Louis Venture Capital. I still stick my toe in the toy industry a little bit. I'm chairman of a 3D printing company that prints some 3D toys. And I'm also, a, well, Elsop Louis, we're the first invest, investor in Niantic, which is a video game company that has Pokemon Go as its uh, one of its main products. So that's what I'm doing these days. Thanks, Tom. Um, I think our audience can tell that there is a lot of toy knowledge on this panel today. Uh, so they also sent in a lot of great questions for us in advance. So I'm going to jump right into some of those. Um, so our first question is around trends. And obviously, there's a lot of trends, you know, going into bringing toys to market. And there's also plenty of new technology. Um, what do you see as the most impactful change in the toy industry that has happened recently? And what do you think is going to be the next big thing? Uh, so I'll start it off with you, David. So I'll let Tom and Sean talk about the exciting parts of it. I'll talk about the, the nuts and bolts. The biggest trend that we're seeing now and into the future is green. 
um, the toy industry is just largely a plastics industry. Plastics made from fossil fuels. And that is not sustainable and cannot be sustainable. And so you see a lot of companies, Hasbro, Mattel, Lego, uh, invest, making big investments and big bets for greener materials. The challenge and, and, and what keeps me up at night is that those greener materials are good for the environment, but the same things that make ABS and PVC plastics bad for the environment make them great for toys. They last forever. They have really great physical properties. They're highly studied and you know exactly how strong they're going to be. They don't degrade when they're in the sun. Um, and all of those things with some of these new materials, we're trying to figure out how do we make toys that are more friendly for the environment while still meeting an increasingly complex regulatory environment. Um, we have a lot of folks who want us to make um, material or toys out of recycled materials. I would love to be able to make more toys out of recycled materials. But at the same time, the limits for contaminants in the materials keeps getting lower and lower and lower. And some of the regulations now have limits that are in the parts per billion. And there are proposals to take that to the parts per trillion levels uh, of purity that's required. Well, let's set aside the fact that there's not even equipment that can measure that low. A single, you know, a single bad piece of plastic or car battery in a thousand truckloads worth of plastics and suddenly you've got contaminants that are beyond the legal limits. And so a lot is going to be, for, for me, a lot of the development, a lot of the trends are going to be the less exciting part, but the, but the back of house trying to figure out how to make toys and continue to make toys that are good for the planet good for the consumers and still safe at all times. And that's, that's going to be a challenge. Yeah. It's really interesting. What about you, Sean? You know, what, what everything's changing and nothing's changing, right? Uh, I, I think the biggest change is that we're moving from a toy economy to a play economy. Yeah. And I, and I think the reason for that is how, people attached to story hasn't changed. You still have a human story adoption process, right? You have to be inspired. Uh, and then once you're inspired, you've seen a story. Now you want to experience it. Then you want to badge with it. Then you want to gather with other people who are uh, the same tribe, right? But what's changed is where inspiration is coming from. Inspiration in 1986, when I was at Kenner Toys, was really clear make a TV show, sell a toy, right? Uh, that isn't the case anymore. Look at Ryan's toys and uh, inspiration came through YouTube, right? Uh, look at TikTok, uh, look at, we are gonna start seeing a lot of, of uh, the integration of gaming and toys, right? Uh, so where kids and adults are finding stories that they wanna buy toys in, um, is changing. It's coming through TikTok. It's coming through YouTube. It's coming through podcasts, right? You know, Slumberkins does podcasts for, uh, for teachers, right? And that becomes a source. So I think that and, uh, and the, you know, the idea that the gathering of, of folks is changing right now so much because of COVID. So, you know, uh, there aren't any kids like I was and even my kids were walking across the aisles of Toys R Us uh, to be inspired. So they are going to um, aggregated fan bases and those aggregated fan bases are creating the, uh, the marketplace uh, to sell directly. Interesting. How about you, Tom? Well, I agree with these guys. Uh, I would what they left me with is my favorite subject, which is the the increasing technology in in toys and games. Uh, and we're talking about obviously the importance of chips and AI and AR. My goodness, look at AR. Look what's happened with Pokemon Go, where people are walking around down the street finding 
objects that they can actually see on their on their iPhones. I suspect the same thing's going to be coming out of Milton Bradley on looking at board games. All of a sudden, characters that look like they're alive are going to be walking around on those game boards. Probably already exists, and I just don't know it. But uh, so those, those technologies and robotics are, are very interesting to me. Uh, the use of, of technology to understand what a child is saying, what a child is interested in, what a child doesn't know was very interesting to me at LeapFrog and being able to make a product adapt to that child so we could actually change the content so that that child experienced help in learning what the, some of the words and phrases or sentences or objects that they didn't understand. So I think all those technology things are very interesting. And I think gamification was mentioned, and that certainly is is happening throughout uh, throughout uh, the world of toys and, and and video games. And then I'm I'm really intrigued by somebody mentioned it earlier. It's play, but play is getting older. You know, when I was in the industry, we always talked about how young the industry was getting. Oh, we're losing all these kids at age ten. Well, now we're not. We're gaining adults playing more and more and more. And and I'm not talking just about video games, although. The video game industry now tells me their average age of a player is 31. When I started in that industry, the average age was 13. So uh, you can see what, what's going on there. But I think it's all very healthy because play is healthy and play is good for us. And, and we all need to keep playing. I love that. I'll keep playing. That's all really interesting. And I, I think consumers are noticing a lot of changes um, as well because we had a lot of questions about things about retail and changing in that space as well. So um, how do you all think that the evolution of, you know, big box stores and online retailers um, has changed the industry, especially you know, with the decline of standalone toy stores? Uh, start with you this time, Tom. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. When I started in the industry, the largest toy retailer was, was Sega, excuse me, was Sears. And Sears was the largest, Penny's was the next largest. The Sears catalog was all important. If you could get space in the Sears catalog, your product had it made for that year. There were thousands of independent toy stores who we couldn't sell to directly very easily because we were a, at Mattel, we were a large company and a lot of these stores couldn't do a minimum order quantity. So there were a lot of wholesalers. And the wholesalers actually took inventory in early, like in August, to be able to supply the, the thousands of retailers they supported across the country. Well, all of that is, of course, gone. With Initially, it was Toys R Us that uh, pushed a lot of them out. And then, of course, Walmart today uh, has pushed a lot of them out. And then along comes Amazon, and it pushes everybody out. Uh, and my understanding is that that Amazon today is about a third of the toy retail business and Walmart's almost a third of the toy retail business and then Target's about 18 percent. So you got three retailers that do over 80 percent of the business in the at least in the United States, which is a, a dramatic, dramatic change and has made. Uh, well, I, you know, you don't need as many. I guess you don't need as many salespeople as we used to need. But it certainly has made it a, a more difficult, I think, a more competitive environment to 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 work in. And I'm glad I'm not doing it now. <laughs> any any additional thoughts, David? Well, I, I guess, um, you know, back in in 2008, when the Consumer Product Safety Improvement Act was being put together, there were a lot of us who really thought that that was going to be erecting enormous barriers to entry for other toy companies coming in because of the high regulatory burden. Well, we didn't anticipate e-commerce very well. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's gone exactly the opposite direction. And there's lots of startups. Um, there's lots of unbranded merchandise. Can I say there's lots of counterfeits? Um, <laughs> There, there's a lot that's out there. there uh, the British Toy and Hobby Association just published today a report that over 50% of the toys on the market in the UK are unsafe and don't meet the, uh, the toy standards. In fact, I think it was 90% that they quoted. Um, and, you know, that's what we're dealing with is there's a lot, there's a lot out there. And we're working really hard. Uh, with the established players in, in the toy associations and toy industries of Europe and trying to build confidence in our products um, 
And, but there's, with these low barriers to entry, there's a lot out there that um, people should be concerned about and people should be a little bit wary. Um, but, um, you know, the flip side is in the old days, all those legions of salespeople that Tom was talking about would fight hard to get the shelf space, to get the whole line. And so you could tell the complete story about your line on the shelf in the e-commerce world that's sort of irrelevant, right? Because you've got as much space as you need and you can create your own little store within the site to tell the story that you want to tell. So that there, there's, there's good and there's challenging aspects as well. Sure. What, are you th what are your thoughts, John? Well, I think, uh, I think everybody said, uh, you know, what's happening uh, is, is that the positive side to this is the growth in inexperience purchase. So, you know, because it's divided now, when I'm in the experience of podcast, TikTok, you, you know, TikTok, YouTube, whatever it is, content, I can quickly, and at the moment I am caught up in the story, click and purchase, right? And and so there there are people finding, I think it's part of why adults are finding uh, so much uh, so much toy uh, opportunities, right? You know, I think, um, you know, I think the other thing is just uh, this idea that, you know, you used to be um, an individual, uh, you know, uh, and then you had to find a community, you know, now you're a community and you're finding and you're showing your individuality uh, by which fan group and which toy and what are you displaying, in, you know, in your home. So kind of Tom said it, you know, Funko is going to do 700 million this year, most of it to adults, you know, uh, and my children who are in their mid 20s. Um, spend as much time on anime as they do on clothes, you know. So it is, uh, it, it, the good news is play has no boundaries now. I can find it wherever I want. I can engage wherever I want. And, and now the challenge is for the toy companies to find those people and those aggregated groups. Sure. Interesting. Uh, so speaking of change, the pandemic has obviously affected almost every industry, um, and I'm sure toys is the same just from talking with all of you before this. So with the holiday season coming up um, and a lot of talk of disruption in the marketplace, you know, what can consumers expect as they head into the end of this year? I'll start it with you this time, Sean. Well, I, I think uh, kudos to David who brought up sustainability, right? I mean, Lego has said they're going to be, you know, completely biodegradable by 2030. Their packaging is going to be biodegradable by 2025. I'm sure Hasbro's, you know, said a lot of the same, you know, set some really lofty goals. Um, so beyond sustainability, I think is um, social relevance, right? And Tom, I loved your comment about Barbie, uh, you know, Barbie has had her ups and downs, um, and yet she is continuing to push on diversity issues, diversity of size issues, diversity of color, diversity of careers, you know, uh, parents, parents are not buying just for um, play, they're, they're buying for impact. So uh, how is, you know, am I buying a doll uh, that is created by, uh, you know, uh, a female led or um, that uh, is touching on um, feeding America or is touching on any of the inequity issues? Uh, if you had asked me in 2008, you know, how important would, would those issues be? I, I wouldn't have said that important. I would have said, yeah, 10%, you know, yeah, we'll give some money to, uh, you know, uh, this, if you buy this dog in the American girl, you know, some money will be raised, but the 90% will not be based on it. I would tell you now half of the decisions coming from parents and caregivers are going to be related to society and social issues. Interesting. What are your thoughts, Tom? 
Well, I, I agree with that. And, and toys have always really reflected what's going on in society. And certainly that's a, a very important part of society today. So we'll see that continuing. But and as I said earlier, I'm, I'm really happy to see uh, the age grade age going up with toys and that retro toys are coming back. Retro being the stuff that I worked on. Yay. So He-Man Masters of the Universe is coming back. A lot of the old Matchbox cars are coming back. Uh, I, uh, the other day, I saw that a Sonic the Hedgehog video game, the original, auctioned for four hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Gosh, I wish I'd known that. I've kept all. I have two hundred and twenty video games here somewhere in this office, but I, I didn't keep cases of them. And if I had, it'd be worth a lot more than my stock portfolio. If I'd kept all the Barbies and the Hot Wheels and the Matchbox and the Sonic uh, or the Sega games I'd worked on, yeah, I you know I would really be living on an island somewhere. Uh, but anyway, I, di I didn't do I didn't do all that. And for this for this upcoming holiday season, I must say I am worried. I was in a Target store last week, and there was basically very little on the shelves. I have three grandchildren. I wanted to buy a specific thing for my grandchild, and I could not find it. I hope I can find it on uh, Amazon or go direct to the company and get it in some some other way. But retail shelves were pretty bleak. And uh, I worry about that. I hope that parents will get out there and start buying early, early, early. Or it's not even early now. We're already into October. But hurry up. Get going. Yeah, that's a good point. I know, David, you're you are still in a toy uh, company, so you can't share too much. But anything you wanted to add? I agree with Tom. Buy early, buy often. Uh, yeah, I, I can't, you know, I, I agree with what they've said. In, in as you mentioned, since I am still employed by a toy company and a publicly traded toy company, I, I don't want to issue anything that might be construed as uh, guidance. Um, but um, it's it's going to be an interesting year. And yeah, uh, um, yeah as always, we encourage you to buy your favorite toys and uh, buy lots of them. <laughs> it, you, you all of you helped put my kids through school so thank you <laughs> all right we're gonna wrap up with my favorite question and we ask this in each one of our the business of talks so can you tell us what has been your favorite experience working in toys and we'll start with you david so this may sound a little corny but at mattel and hasbro uh, we believe really strongly in giving back to the communities. And whether it was my time in Southern California, dressing up as Santa Claus, going to a, an elementary school in the Watts neighborhood and delivering toys and, and snow and uh, playing with the kids out in the schoolyard with snow or doing something similar in China and taking several hundred uh, students with learning disabilities to a local park and playing with them for a day, whether you call it a day of play or a day of joy, those are the days where you really remember that you're doing this for the kids. And all of us in the toy industry are really focused on making the world a better place for kids and their families. That is so cool. Definitely don't need the extra snow here in Wisconsin, but no. <laughs> you don't need need down uh, in California. So thanks for that, David. Uh, how about you, Tom? Well, that, that's a wonderful story, Dave. I like that a lot. And we could certainly use some of that snow here in Northern California. We need water. Mm -hmm. Anyway, my favorite uh, stories are, are pretty much the same in all, all the companies I worked in. It was building the team of people, hiring the right people or promoting the right people or finding the right people. And, uh, and be, helping them become successful by doing things a little differently than the companies or brands had been doing them. And that certainly was true with Barbie and it certainly was true with Matchbox and it certainly was true at Sega. And I'm just so pleased that I had the opportunity to work with these great people. I'm very close to many of them still today, you know, 40 years later uh, from Mattel days, uh, 30 years later from Sega days. I, I actually talked to, many of my former colleagues almost every week. And so, uh, you know, and, and, and by the way, they all, they were great people. And they went on and did very interesting things. So that's what pleases me the most about my experience in the toy industry. Awesome. And it sounds like it's a very tight community from talking to the three of you and 
all of the people you know in common. That's great. Uh, and how about you, Sean? Well, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, the first one is, you know, just what, what Tom and David said, it, it is a very tight community. If anybody listening is thinking about, well, should I go into the toy business, right? Why would I go into the toy business? I would say for me, what kept pulling me back and now even in semi-retirement, that's all I do is, is toy, toy companies, um, is primarily uh, the why, right? What makes an adult man have a Batman den, right? What, <laughs> what makes, um, I was sharing a story earlier about when I decided to retire. <laughs> 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 exactly, exactly. I, you know, well, last time we met, I pulled my Grogu up and was like, I paid $300 for this. You know, uh, I mean, it, it, we, we, if you're interested in this business, it is a very creative business. What do I mean by that? 90% of the SKUs are new each year. So if you're somebody who likes product development, right? You know, versus working for a soup company that might change a skew once every 10 years. You know, for me, that was what something that really brought me into it. I, I think the other piece is human nature. So I was at Kenner and one of my favorite stories, we were, I won't say which brand, but you might be able to guess. Uh, I was on boys toys and we were in focus groups for a new boys toy where the action figures were molded to carry guns because in 86, you could have characters carrying guns and you fed caps through the back of the character and squeeze their legs so they could shoot at each other. Okay, right? I know you're like, oh my God, Sean, you know, but it was 1986. And, but what was funny <laughs> was while we were watching behind the glass, the boys playing with these characters, the caps, because they're actually gunpowder, right? Started bursting into flame. And the, the character, the, the dolls, the, you know, the, the, the figures started bursting into flames. The boys ranked that as the highest rated toy Kenner had ever designed. They thought it was great. I can shoot flames at my sister. I This is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And we're running in there trying to keep them from burning the place down. So, you know, the human nature about what makes people excited, what is fun, stumbling across what doesn't work, because guess what? We never launched that line. Because <laughs> we didn't want to set everybody's houses <laughs> on fire. But there's always something to test to fail, you fail fast in toys. Boy, I can, you know, Tom and David would agree with me there. You think you got the winner and you know in six months you don't have a winner. And so you fail fast and you learn and you try and you're always creating and it's it's magical. I love that. I'm sure David, you just love having toys start on fire and your quality and safety. Uh, yeah, we, we try not to do that. <laughs> That's why I didn't say what the brand was. <laughs> so funny. Oh, this was so fun. Um, I want to thank each of you for taking the time to share your experiences with us. I know that the audience has having a great time chatting in the comments, so I know it was very engaging for them. Um, it's always so exciting to hear about the fantastic careers of fellow Badgers and our friends. So um, we really appreciate you all sharing your stories and perspectives. So thank you. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you. All right. And I just want to thank everyone watching tonight, too. We're glad you tuned in and hope you enjoyed yourselves. Uh, if you would, we would love your feedback via our survey. So there's a link in the chat um, if you would like to um, give us your feedback there. We also will be um, sending it to you in an email if, um, if you've registered for tonight's event. So uh, I also hope you join me uh, this December for the business of cheese, which is a very Wisconsin topic. Uh, so we'll be diving into that with some of our alumni in that industry. So watch your email inboxes for more information soon. Uh, have a wonderful evening and on Wisconsin. <laughs>